I should say welcome back, Greg Schwim, because you're back again. Yeah, I am. Well, <laughs> but but this is the first time that we've we've been looking at each other, Mark. So we've all, we've just been listening to each other and disagreeing with one another. <laughs> so now, yo, now like- I get to read your face when I say something you, that you're that you're going to say. Um, I'll make another point. <laughs> I'm I'm having trouble with that since I've gone into the video podcasting world That's because right. uh, most of my guests yeah. couldn't see all the faces I was pulling before you. Yeah? <laughs> But uh, listen, it's great to have you back, and uh, we're going to have a chat about all kinds of things today, starting off with that fish behind your head, because uh, I'm sure that yeah. everybody yeah, around I, the I world wants that. to know. I can see that. So there you go. There's a look. That's a that's a muskie. It's that a, is a muskie. muskie that was caught up in northern Wisconsin, in Hayward, Wisconsin. Right. And um, that is my dog, by the way. I was going to say, is that the fish barking? It. Yeah, no, that's not the fish. Yeah, that's my dog, who's been... Quiet all day, but did you, did you know it's International Dog Day? You told me it As was. We're yeah. this, today is International Dog Day, so I think the dog was just sort of real, letting everybody know that it is her day. Um, but uh, yeah, so the fish is. Uh, uh, so the fish get. You notice the fish is above my wife. <laughs> That's my <laughs> wife. That's the fish. I, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to go is, there. Is, uh, I look at the fish. I caught that fish with my dad, who's been gone about six years now, and uh, uh, so it was in. It was in his place, and then when he passed, I, uh, I I took the fish. So it's kind of a a shrine to him. Salt water or fresh water? Fresh water, fresh water. Yeah, fresh water. we caught it in miserable weather. We hadn't had a bite. We hadn't had a bite in like two and a half days. I mean, when I say we had a bite, we, we hadn't had even a bite. Forget catching a fish, because <laughs> you catch muskie, they, they, apparently they swim by themselves. So it's not like you just run into a school of them. Yeah. And uh, so we landed that one. And the guy that was, we had a fishing guide, and he said, he said to my dad, he said, if, if you don't want to mount this fish, I have to throw it back. I have to, I have to release it. Oh. And my dad looks at me, and he goes, what do you think? And, and, and that rain is pelting us sideways, Mark. I mean, that's the kind of weather we were fishing in. It was October and it was about to snow. And I go, what do I think? I go, that's not a, that's not a legitimate question, is it? Take the fish and let's go home. So, so needless to say, yes, we took the fish. Is it, is it, starting, is it starting to smell yet? No, no, they did a very nice job. <laughs> or something like that. No, it's it's been it it hasn't moved in, in five years. I was gonna I was gonna say your wife because she's pretty in pretty close proximity to it. If it's starting to smell, you better move your wife. I think that's right. Yeah. So if you want another tour, I mean, so there's my wife, and then on the other side there. Uh, is uh, um, is sort of a golf shrine. There's a picture of my dad and I again at Pebble Beach, and in the middle there is a scorecard from Pebble Beach. Oh. We played around, oh. and then on the other side is a. Uh, I went to the Masters a few years ago. Right. Uh, on, on behalf of a company that I was working for, Teradata. They yeah. invited me down. Yeah. And that was like that was like a little uh, souvenir that they gave to everybody. So, yeah, so I've got two of the best golf courses in the world represented on my back wall. Fantastic. Let's talk about that because um, I want to know whether you've actually parred the 18th at Pebble Beach or how many balls you lost in the water. That's the first question. Well, you know, here's the thing. I I, I will say I uh, uh, I parred the uh, – I, I did par that number seven hole, that little <clears throat> par three that goes right over mm. you. It's like mm. 105 yards. Mm. I parred that one. I did make That's a, a tough hole. Like, That's a tough yeah, hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the most gorgeous hole in the world. The thing is, when we played Pebble, we, I, I still am a little ticked off at Pebble Beach because we played it on the day, the first day of, I guess, not really daylight savings time. It's when you get an hour less of daylight. So okay. it's like November 1st is when right. we played. So that's the first day you set your clocks back. Mm. And... We teed off at about 1.30, and the, the lady who booked the round told me that the average round at Pebble Beach takes four and a half hours. So she said, so you should be done by six, which should be fine. Okay, for anybody who's watching this that might want to play Pebble, the average round at Pebble does not take four and a half hours because you're taking photos for an hour and a half. The average round at Pebble takes at least five I would go five and a half. So, long story short, we played the 18th hole in the dark. I was gonna. Uh, I, I was, 
it was it was kind of sad because the last like three holes at Pebble are the most amazing holes, and the the, the ocean is just is is just up on you. And um, by the time we got to eighteen, we were rushing trying to get through to get the daylight, and we just I I mean I hit a it was one of those I hit my tee shot, and I said that well that um that felt like it was straight. <laughs> <laughs> now the thing with Pebble Beach is there's there's two kinds of days that you can play pebble beach one is when the wind's blowing and one is when the wind's not blowing so we right. did you have a calm day when you were there i i had a pretty calm day i will say I, it, it it did it did there were a few it's weird it kind of comes and goes there were a few holes that all of a sudden i mean you're 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 starting a sweater in a sweater and then you take the sweater off and then you put the sweater back on with a rain jacket on top of that and the next thing you know you take that off so it was a little bit of everything but uh, uh, it was an amazing day, and um, it was it was I I treated my dad to it, and it was it was a treat for him. I was actually performing in uh, Reno, oh. so we 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 went to Reno, and I did my show, and then we we just hightailed it over to uh, the Monterey Peninsula, and we uh, we played there. It's a beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Like it's, oh yeah, you it know, really is. You can often yeah. see uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, you know, walking around Carmel there, and uh, you yeah, know, I you... think he was the mayor at the time, which is just so funny, <laughs> you know. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was some. Oh, speaking of which, I just found out yesterday that like Max Weinberg, the drummer for Bruce Springsteen, like just like took a seat on a on a Tampa political board or something like that like not the city council but like something even below that and and uh the the comments on uh it, oh it had something to do with roads with highways and 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 people were like they w once that made it out on twitter people were like well you know i hope he goes out and fixes the badlands and there were all these like springsteen references <laughs> very cool very of cool. course i chimed in and i said this sounds like this sounds like it's not a true story. Somebody needs to prove it all night. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, Max Weinberg is now like a Tampa politician. Oh, brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. Look, I'm not going to let you um, move on from Pebble Beach yet until you finish your excuses uh, on why you didn't play a good round after the three holes, last three holes were in darkness. Were there any other excuses you've got for your score? <laughs> no, there were no other excuses. I, 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 I did pretty well. And uh, um, I was I was pretty happy with my round, but uh, yeah, that was but when you're yeah when you're playing the last part of it in the dark. And I, but on that note, though, and my my golf game is uh, uh, has gotten pretty good this uh, this summer. I've had a little more time to play, and I actually for the first time in my life today, I took a putting lesson. I took a one hour putting lesson, mm, mm. which was uh, which was very interesting because I'm actually going to Las Vegas for a couple of days uh, starting on on Friday. And I'm going to play some golf out there, and uh, I wanted to uh, um, I wanted to go out there with something new to try. Are you going to drive to Vegas? No, I'm not going to drive. No, I, and that'll be the first plane ride I've been. I'm, see, this is how long it's been since I've been off a plane. Didn't that sound like a four year old saying? Yeah. I'm going to go on a plane ride. I'm going to plane ride. I'm go, yeah, yeah. I'm, being, I'm not. I'm not taking a flight. I'm not catching a flight. I'm taking a plane ride. I sound like I'm, yeah, about four four years old. But yes, I'm taking my first plane ride in five months. I have not been on a flight since the lockdown began. Mm. How do you feel about yeah. that? How are you feeling about I, getting getting back on a plane again? You know, I don't know. I guess, uh, I, I mean, I've flown so much in my life. I guess I don't really, I, I, I've already talked to some people who've been in airports and have been on flights and, you know, they say, obviously, wear a mask and, you don't get anything to eat. You don't get anything to drink. There's no service of any kind. You you basically just get a seat. And um, okay, I mean that's ultimately why you fly anyway. Is you just want a seat so you can get somewhere faster. So um, I, I always was very good at entertaining myself on planes. I, I was never one of these people that w was thinking, oh well, I can't, if the drink cart doesn't come around in the next 30 minutes, this is going to be a lousy flight. I mean, I, I always just got myself on the flight and pulled out my laptop or a good book that I've been wanting to read, and next thing you know, I was there, and that's what I plan to do again, except I'll be wearing a mask. <laughs> well, f for the sake of uh, everyone watching and listening today, I hope they go back and listen to your previous shows with me, because they'll know you're quite notorious for taking airplane flights and not actually getting off the plane. <laughs> 
Yeah, at, that's true. At the destination. Exactly. I'm going to make people listen for the, to come up with that. But yes, I I do. I have been known to just stay <clears throat> on the plane and wait until it turns around. And I'm the only I'm the only guy that takes a round trip ticket, um, basically, <laughs> right away. <laughs> hey, have you been to Besto? Do you know where Besto is? No, where is that? Besto is between LA and Vegas. So you're not going to get to go there this time. But I tell you what, you, yeah. you of all, all the people I know, you're a guy that needs to go to Besto because it's... Do you know what it's famous for? No. You wouldn't do because you haven't heard of the place. It's um, That's right. It's got the world's tallest thermometer. Which, which, <laughs> really? Which is very apt these days because we're in the time where people's temperature is being taken a lot uh, for all sorts, okay. of, all sorts of reasons. This is not one thermometer that you can sit on, though. I can tell you that because... It's about nine stories high. Okay, and this takes this this takes people's temperatures, or this takes ouch. Uh. Yeah, no, no, we can't go there. But um, yeah. I can tell you, it's right. it's a sight to be seen. Is this big thermometer that's sitting in the middle of the desert? And uh, really, yeah, you need to get to Besto one time in your life to check it out because okay. it's it'll give you a lot of material for your show for a start. All right, are, are you, no, you say bear, is it Barstow you're talking about? Oh, Barstow, yeah, that's it. Sorry, Barstow. Bar Barstow, okay. yeah. So I now you know where it is. Barstow's in Nevada, isn't it? Yeah, it is in Nevada. Okay, yeah. Bar see, that's this, now. See, we this is the second time on this <laughs> on this podcast that I have not been able to understand you for the first time that we've been recording. But but yeah, we had a little conversation off the air, and and I uh, uh, there was something I, I I couldn't understand the accent. That that's the first time I've had that issue. Yeah. And now I, it's happened twice I, in fifteen I, minutes. I tell you what, I'm going to tell everybody the truth behind that because I was just saying the word app, and he couldn't understand me saying the word I app. I not understand the word app. <laughs> Yeah. He said, do you have an app, something on your phone? I thought there was like some cord coming out of it or something. I was staring at my phone. I know what an app is, by the way. <laughs> hey, uh, before we go any further, because you've 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 just upset my entire population of New Zealand when you're talking about the best golf courses in the world behind you there. And um, New, oh, New Zealand okay. actually has the best golf courses in the world. So if you ever do get down to that part of the world, be careful now because you've you insulted a lot of people. Okay, I, I've insulted the locals yeah. and the local golfers. Well, yeah. if anybody wants to invite me down, <laughs> uh, I'm more than happy to shoot an episode of A Comedian Crashes Your Pad in New Zealand. You know, we can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I don't think I've played much. I've played golf in some of the Caribbean islands. I had my ball stolen by a monkey mm, um, in mm, Barbados. Mm, mm. <laughs> so it just ran out and took it. So That's funny. I've had my ball hit by a monkey. Oh really? <laughs> or you've hit a monkey? No, I I I was the monkey hitting the ball. That's what it was oh, like anyway okay. when uh, when right. I was trying to play. But uh, okay, so you've had a had a ball stolen by a monkey. You know what happens here in Australia? They actually um, have all sorts of animals stealing your golf balls down here. Magpies love them. The birds come down and swoop swoop down and pick them up and take them off. Okay. All right. Now, when I lived in Florida, there was, I, I mean, I never had gators stealing my ball, but put it this way, if I put, if I hit one near it, that was a lost ball. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, if people haven't worked out yet, you're a funny man and that's because you're a comedian and you do it for a living as uh, yes. I'm just trying to keep pace with you. That's all and try to make it uh, worthwhile for people to watch and listen to the show. But uh, let's talk about how it's all going because you've been on the show a couple of times. And as you said, this is the first time we've had a chance to actually see each other. And I'm really keen to hear about how the comedy world is evolving through COVID-19. And you were telling me off air that there's some exciting things that are starting to happen and you recently just did a show where that started. You want to share a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I have been doing some virtual comedy shows uh, since this has happened. I have done some for uh, big corporations, and then I did one Monday night for just the general. I've done a couple this past week for just the general public. And um, when you hear the word virtual comedy, you probably think, well, that's that. No, that sounds so. You're saying that you just. You just perform in front of your computer to people who are all, all over the place. That that sounds too weird. Um, that is exactly what I do. And while it is weird, um, I'll be the first one to admit that it is it is what we're doing now. Uh, entertainers need to entertain. It's that simple. Hmm. And I think the the enter no business, I, I shouldn't say that because I know the travel industry, but I think very few businesses have been hit as hard as the entertainment business. 
because I don't care what kind of entertainment you're in. You, you're not an entertainer unless you're in front of a live audience. I don't care whether you're a, um, an actor, um, well, maybe a stage actor, but you know, if you're a movie actor, you still are surrounded by an awful lot of people um, to put you on that screen. But whether you're a stage actor, a singer, a dancer, a comedian, a musician, you need that live audience. And that's what the world is lacking now is live audiences. So I, I don't care if you're somebody like me whose average uh, audience is maybe in the three to 400 range or you're somebody who is uh, playing stadiums. None of us are working right now. None of us are doing what we have been so accustomed to doing. And um, what we're having to do is figure out ways that we can do what we love and what we know people want. And that's why I have started doing virtual shows. And that is it's just what it is. It's me standing in front of a computer and I do my act and I, I see people on a screen just like on a, on a Zoom call that we've all gotten so accustomed to where there's just boxes full of people and uh, they could be anywhere doing anything and I am doing my my show for them. And when I first started doing them, I was I just thought to myself, this I, 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 can't, I can't work this way. I'm not used to this. I'm used to getting those big, huge laughs. Um, not all the time, but occasionally I do. And, uh, you know, how, how can I do this? But the more I did them, the more I, I kind of put myself in my audience's position. Meaning, I have to remember that there's a lot of people, they're sitting at their home because they can't go anywhere either. They can't come to that club or, or that venue to see somebody. So this is the way they are being entertained. Mm. And if they're going to get on the computer and, and sit there and watch me, then I have to give it my all. I, I can't sit there and say, well, you know, I, I can't give it the, even let them for one minute feel like, oh, this is stupid that I'm doing this. Um, and that's what I do. Mm. I mean, I, I feel like the more that I've done them, I the barriers have been broken. And I, yeah, I might tell my best joke and I might hear three people <coughs> laughing. Um, some people might ha not have their microphones on, which I think is weird. If you're gonna come to a, you know, see, see a comedian uh, virtually, you should probably help him out by putting your sound on. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but that doesn't always work. I mean, we're, we're also, um, limited to the technology. The technology can be a strain because, you know, if you're ever on a Zoom call or a virtual call and you've got a hundred people on and they've all got their microphones open, the more people do that, the more you're going to have background noise, interference, dogs barking, babies crying, people, you know, coming into the room saying, what are you listening to? Uh, you know, people taking phone calls that kind of thing. I mean, I, I did a, I did one of these shows and there were about 1200 people on it. Mm. And afterwards I, afterwards I read all the chats. I can't read those while I'm doing the show, but I, I, I was reading the chat and there was one guy who chatted. He said, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> and all you people who have your microphones open are making it very difficult for me. So could you all turn your microphones off? So I can enjoy the show. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I don't want. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, again, you're, you're living, you're, you're, as I always say, you play with the hand you're dealt. And that has always been my philosophy, even in live shows. If, if somebody says, you know, Greg, we, uh, um, all the lights in the back of the room went out. So, you know, you're, you're, we're only going to have half the lights. Up, and I, I, all I can say is, okay, let's do this. Let's do it. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Yeah, but I, I do find people laughing in a remote in remote areas to be very gratifying. Mm. And, um, mm. I'm doing more of them. More companies are realizing that um, we have to keep our employees upbeat and entertained and motivated. And um, and I think more people just want to laugh. It, it goes back to it goes back to the depression, Mark. I mean, in the Great Depression, they say that the one uh, industry that made money during the 1930s in the when nobody had any money was movie theaters mm, mm. people still went to see movies and mm. they, they did that because they wanted to escape mm. they wanted to escape the reality mm. and i feel that's a little bit of what's happening now yeah and uh, you know i think we will get back to live entertainment but who knows and in the meantime i i need a stage to perform because that's what i'll, I'll have known all i've known for the past 30 years mm. 
great sharing there. I've got lots of questions as a result of what, what you've just shared with us all. The first one is around um, getting yourself up to perform. How, how difficult and how different is it knowing that you're going to be, as you say, standing in front of a computer versus going up from behind the curtain and rapturous yeah. applause when you get on stage uh, and yeah. I, I've you know you've told me before that you're when you first go on stage with a live audience you're, you're waiting 10 minutes for the crowd to calm down before you can start your gig right yeah there's there's a there's an adrenaline rush in doing obviously a live audience just knowing those people are out there waiting to see you um I find myself being more nervous for these virtual shows but more not because it's like not because I think Oh, I'm not going to be funny. I, I, I'm very nervous about the technology. Mm. Uh, there's so much technology that you're relying on, and that a lot of it you don't have control over. Um, I can't tell. I mean, this the show that I did Monday night. I did a show that was put on by um, a group that calls itself the Nowhere Comedy Club, mm -hmm. and that's what they've done. They have just enlisted comedians around the country to every night perform and, and people uh, buy ticket, you buy a ticket for it and then you, they send you a Zoom link and that's how you get on. But um, after the show, I found out that there were certain people, including my wife, who was wa trying to watch from a different room, who never got sound. Um, yeah. I had other people lately, later who told me they had video issues. And then yet there are other people who said, oh, it looked and sounded great. So what do you do? Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can only you can only kind of keep your fingers crossed that everybody is uh, um, is 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 getting is, is the technology is going to hold out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and if it doesn't, you don't even know that. So that alone makes me nervous. But once I if I can put that out of my mind, <clears throat> then I think it's just like a regular show. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I, I find myself being more probably more animated than I would in front of a live audience because you have to sell it more you you really you you have to sell what you're you you have to make people forget yep. that they are watching this remotely yeah and that's a very hard thing to do but yeah. i think that's really the goal of my show is just to is just to say you know it's not the environment that you're used to but you can still laugh I think there's an interesting psychology going on here, though, because there's a, a lot of different factors in play. You talk about the technology side of it. You talk about the comedians, um, I guess, desire and, and attitude to pivot and do their act in a different way. But you've also got the audience who are com who are becoming familiar, I guess, with this new way of digesting the content. Do you do you find that's something that's going to evolve? Do you reckon over time people are going to get more and more comfortable with digesting the content in this way? I think they will. I think they will because they don't have a choice. Mm. They they don't have a choice. I mean, we we've been through this before, but not to this extent and not to this length. I mean, we had a after the market crash of 08, 09 in this country and things like corporate meetings, you know, people, the stock market plummeted, corporate meetings were completely not in vogue because it was too much money and these corporations that are asking for bailouts shouldn't be having these lavish events at Las Vegas and Orlando and so forth. And a lot of companies did pivot to virtual, mm. but they did it for a very short amount of time because they, they like tried it once. And mm. they said, well, this is stupid. Mm. And they just right away went back to the hotels. They just spent less money. Mm. We don't have that option this time. Mm. We don't have that option because the hotels and so forth aren't open. So this is it, whether you like it or not. And so, yes, I think people will be getting more comfortable with it. They don't necessarily have to like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I, think, I think the one thing that we're still not getting comfortable with is people uh, giving their full focus to the meeting i mean i that's the one thing i do notice i i can tell when i'm doing these shows you know i can see people looking down and and they're you know doing doing that because we you you all you know what i'm doing right now mm, Mark. Mm, I mean, mm. looking at my phone mm, right mm. or i'm you know i've seen people get up leave the room things like that um and unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you what do you think in terms of the uh, number of comedians that are pivoting in this way? I'm sh I'm sure that not everyone's doing it. So, have you no. have you had word no. on the street that a lot of people have actually decided, okay, it's not for me. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to yeah. you know, wait until I, I, I can go back. I think there's an awful lot of entertainers that are just saying, I'm just going to wait until it comes back. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. Mm. I, I I can't. I, 
to me, the longer you wait, the the more out of touch you get and the less practice you have. I mean, you know, entertainers, we need to practice. We need to we need to be trying new things all the time. So to sit there and say, well, I'm just going to wait until comedy clubs reopen and hotels reopen and corporate meetings start um, start coming back. I, I'm not willing. To, I'm not willing to. Wait. And um, and that's why I think I've had some success hmm. doing what I do. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's really cool. And I, as you know, I run a, a, a global business podcast, and I interview CEOs and business leaders from across the world about how they're pivoting during COVID nineteen and what they're doing. And um, the message is loud and clear: if you don't try new things, if you don't um, you know put yourself out there, get outside your comfort zone, then yep. uh, you're not going to reap the rewards. You've now gone to overnight a global audience, right? Potential. You, you you've gone yeah, from. I mean, I'm, I'm- reaching out now to like event planners in the UK and to Europe because to me now the, the, there's no rules I don't have to worry about you know I you know to me that's the another good thing about virtual is that you know I, I used to never I, I used to not really stay in touch with or I, I used to try but not as much as it, it, I'd see event planners in say Spain uh, and I might I might say to them I might you know try and contact them and say, have you ever considered bringing somebody from the states over to Spain? And, uh, no, we, you know, we've got a pretty good supply of of comedians here. Why would we do that? But with virtual, there's no boundaries. Yeah. So yeah. that's my goal now is to just really get in touch with some of these international event planners, whether they're in Australia or New Zealand or wherever, and mm. say, now's, now's the time. Mm. Now's the time for me to have some fun with an audience that completely on the other side of the world. And this allows me to do that. And it, and it doesn't sound weird. It doesn't sound weird that I'm approaching you and saying, uh, why don't you have a guy from Chicago <laughs> come to your meeting? I, you know. And, that, and another thing on this, uh, if I can also pivot a little bit on humor, I will say one thing. I think humor is becoming more respected now in this pandemic. I, I, I really do believe humor, respected might not be the right word, but I think humor uh, was in somewhat of a very precarious position before this with a lot of you know the the political correctness and so forth and I, I think people now and this is something I'm really hammering home in my virtual shows now to the point where I'm almost just kind of getting in the face of, of the people and just saying you have to stop thinking about the negative ramifications and you have to focus more on the positive you have to focus more on what humor can do in a positive light as opposed to just constantly brushing it aside and saying uh you know we just you know there's 20 people on the committee and one person didn't like that one joke we saw of yours on the your demo tape and therefore pass you know swipe left Uh, and um i i think that was happening a lot and it shouldn't be and it should not be and for the reasons i for the reasons i said earlier yeah is that people want to be entertained that's simple I think, need to be. I, think, I think we're seeing a new world of, of psychology in the respect to two things. The first one is about humor, which I agree with you on. The second one is about authenticity and people being raw and being vulnerable during these times. And I think if you watch content online and you see people talking about, hey, I'm having a bad day today. Today is a bad day. It's not a nice day. I'm struggling and I need help. Um, there's a lot more of that going on and people are being more heartfelt about that. At the same time, there's plenty of people out there who are being positive. And, you know, the amount of innovation I've seen in business in the last three or four months has been extraordinary. Um mm-hmm. Business leaders mm-hmm. coming up with ideas with new products and new technologies yeah. and, and new things. We've got so much to be thankful for in terms of what's going on at the moment, as you have within right. your industry, right? Because it's opened up yeah. a whole new world. You were just telling me off air before we started that you're going to be doing a show in Russian shortly. Is that right? Uh, no, I didn't say that. In Russia? <laughs> no, in Russian. But, but if anybody from speak, Russia is listening, speaking oh, Russian, Russian, yeah. Yeah. I'll be more than happy to. <laughs> but, you know, on a serious point, that's sometimes what keeps me going in the morning because I, I have those days, too. I have those days when I because, you know, it's very easy to say the rug's been pulled out from under me. Um, and I think that's that's difficult, I think, for, again, everybody who does what I do, because this is this is no fault of our own. 
it, it's not like I my work has gone down because I was on stage and I said I you know I I, I dropped a four letter word or I insulted the CEO on stage and word got out and word will get out in my business if you do something like that. Uh, I, I've known some very funny comedians who could be killing it in the corporate in, in the corporate world and just allowed one show to just get the best of them and say something they shouldn't have and and they've been blacklisted. Um, I'm very fortunate the fact that I have that's never happened to me. Hmm. But I so but again so not having work and so forth this was nothing that I did and I think that that could cause people to be very bitter. Um, but at the same time when I have those days I think to myself, what what am I missing? What what avenue can I go down? You mentioned that about uh, this is giving businesses a chance to be creative and to reinvent and to think of some new way without saying thinking outside the box because that's so cliche. But and I feel like I'm doing that, too. I mean, every day I just feel like, is there something that I can do or some service I can provide or some way I can tell people? And that's that's really what keeps me going. And um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing because it, when you've been doing this as long as I have, it's very easy to get complacent, and that's the, that's what you don't want to do in this business. Yeah, and and I want to I want to just talk about that because it's obviously putting some uh, pressure on you to re-engineer yourself, which I think is a great thing because it's making us uh, look at things in a whole completely new way. One of the things that we shouldn't forget about is the actual way that it's putting uh, a new spiel on the consumer and how the consumer is looking at this stuff now. So, you know, the consumer knows that they can't go to a comedy club, they can't go and do some of the things they were doing before. So they've got to consume that content in a different way. And I guess in terms of those comedians that are stepping up and putting, you know, first of all, regular content out there, how many how many shows do you have the capacity of doing now versus what you were doing before? How, how, yeah. How's that changed, right? Yeah, I mean, I literally, I, I can do I can do a couple in a day mm. if, if need. Mm. You know, I, I can't I couldn't do that before. I couldn't get on a plane. There was only one time. There was one time that I booked two shows, two corporate gigs in San Antonio, Texas, uh, on the exact same day, in hotels that were across the street from one another. It was really cool. Mm. <laughs> like, how does how does this happen? Yeah, for two completely different. One was one was uh, like electrical engineers, and one was. Uh, uh, like uh, rescue, like paramedics. <laughs> Don't ask me how, how that happened. And all I could think the whole day was, do not mix these people up. <laughs> yeah, that, so, that's true. Be, be because I customize my material. It's like don't be don't be telling ambulance jokes to the electricians. But <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, it has allowed. You know, it's now when people. Now when people say like, you know, I look at my calendar and now when I get like an interest in a certain day and I see that maybe I have a virtual show, I don't say, oh, I can't do that. I go, what time? Yeah. What time? Yeah. Because yeah. If, 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 if yours is at nine and the other one's at one in the afternoon, let's do it. So how do you accommodate things where you might get a interest to do a show in another part of the world and you have a time zone thing going on? How does how does that play out for you? I have no problem with that. I mean, if, if, I, if I need to be on at three in the morning um, because, you know, they want me for a for a, a, a 10 a.m. show in the U.K., I have no problem with that. Mm. Um, mm. I, I you know, when I was doing live shows, I mean, I, I I got off red eye flights and literally stepped on a stage an hour later. Uh, you know, funny's funny. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to do what I do, then you, you can't sit there and complain about, oh, but I can't I can't be funny at 2 a.m. Sure, I can be funny at 2 a.m. I just get up at midnight and have some coffee. Mm, mm. <laughs> I was going to I was going to say, I know you well enough that at 2 a.m. You're probably funnier than ever. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the, I, the earliest I've ever done a show, a corporate show was, I think, 730 a.m. Mm. that's too early mm. that was too early that one did not go well mm. <laughs> and the latest probably i mean i i probably have to go back to my club days oh okay i'll tell you this one this was this had nothing to do with corporate but i did do a show at 3 30 in the morning i did one of these i don't know this this was this is really popular in the um in the states for high school graduations they do these things called lock-ins have you ever heard of these no Okay, so after graduation, what they've started doing, it, so kids don't 
go out and maybe make wrong decisions um, after graduating is that the school will have like an all night party in the school. Okay. And the parents and the administrators put it on and they basically after graduation, which is over about 9 p.m. or so forth for most schools, the party starts at 10 mm -hmm. and it goes on and it takes place in the school and they just have activities and all the parents. I volunteered for this with my daughter and so forth. But my my sister, when her oldest one graduates, that'd be my niece. She said, would you like to do comedy um, in one of the classrooms for the kids? And of course, I'm always willing to help out with stuff like that. And I go, sure. So she says, is, is 3 a.m. OK? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say? No. You know. <laughs> So, yeah, 3 a.m. Yeah, 3 a.m. in my mind was OK. But all I remember was all I remember was, uh, uh, again, I was performing for 17 year olds. And all I remember <laughs> was at one point I, I, I'm, I'm in a classroom and I see, you know, I see the hallway and I see some kids going past the room because there's a lot of different activities going on. And one kid, I just see a silhouette of him and he passes and he pokes his head in and he stands there and all of, a, all of a sudden I hear him go, damn, I'm funnier than this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he left. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. So that was that was a punch to the gut. 17-year-olds. <laughs> they come up with it every yeah, exactly. time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Judged by a 17-year-old recent graduate at like a five hours you've had your diploma and all of a sudden you're going to judge me? <laughs> Hey, that's a great segue into talking about tree houses, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's where I was going. <laughs> so, uh, in all seriousness, you explain that. in all seriousness, as I do want to talk about tree houses now, because you you recently had a wonderful experience, and it's also something else that you're doing to diversify your portfolio in changing times, I might add, and. Um, it's an extraordinarily funny thing, but it's also a really good thing because it's helping people um, in terms of their traveling accommodation options. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I started a, a TV series a couple of years ago called A Comedian Crashes Your Pad. So it's a comediancrashesyourpad.com. And we've talked a little bit about this on your podcast before where I got fascinated with the home sharing market and I started staying in home share properties, interesting properties run by interesting people who I chose. Um, and I would do this in, in towns and cities where I have to be performing. And um, so I started filming my encounters with these people. And when obviously when the pandemic hit, that also shut down the travel industry. I picked two great occupations to be in quarantine, <laughs> to be an entertainer and traveler. Wow, there you go. <laughs> could, could, I, could I think of anything worse than those two? You're lucky. Those two industries have been hit harder than those two. But anyway, so I, I obviously wasn't able to shoot any new episodes. And I finally went out and I shot one in, I went to Nashville two weeks ago. I drove. Um, Very good. Is about seven hours away. It's also where my shooter uh, slash editor lives. Mm -hmm. So that made it easy. But one thing that we found is that people still want to travel, but the, the, they want to stay now. What's what's getting very popular, at least in the States, are places like our accommodations like uh, luxury tents, um, you know, uh, campers, those kind of things, campgrounds, places where people feel safe because they're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they want these very rural locations mm. because they feel like they are in a more controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And um, also in that group is tree houses. Tree houses have become very popular, uh, not just for the, the novelty of it, but now because they are in these types of locations. So I found one in uh, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, which mm -hmm. is about 25 miles outside of Nashville, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I filmed my first uh, my first episode back on the road, and uh, <clears throat> it really opened up a whole new way of traveling. It was very educational and enlightening for me, and the the host could not have been nicer. And this place was impossible to find, <laughs> but I did manage to find it, and I had a wonderful night. I did a live broad live Facebook broadcast there with the owner. We wore masks, you know, we social distanced, we did all the right things, and um, I, uh, uh, I, 
it opened up a whole new way of traveling to me. Mm. And um, mm. I can't wait to do something like that again. Yeah, fantastic. So if you're out there watching and listening to Greg and I today, you're going to be able to find all the links to Greg's uh, material, both his comedy show and also his, um, let's say, luxurious camping episodes as well. <laughs> Glamping. <laughs> That's what they call here. Glamour camping Glamour. that's how that word came in that's becoming really popular meaning you camp but you have wi-fi and uh uh you know you have sort of all the uh the amenities that you're used to netflix i had netflix in the treehouse all right so it wasn't exactly they told me there might be like a bear outside seen him, <laughs> but you also have netflix and amazon prime fantastic so I got the best of everything now when when greg talk greg is a very successful comedian folks so when he talks about a comedian crashing your pad he's not talking about a helicopter pad in this particular instance no. he's talking about your no, your, your home live with you. i get to live with you more importantly you have to live with me <laughs> So, so Greg, if someone's watching this in the U.S. and uh, they, they've got somewhere for you to come and hang out and do one of these, are you open to taking um, suggestions from the audience here? Absolutely. Absolutely. I looked for, you know what I look for? I mean, people say, how do you find your places? Um, and I, I, would, I wouldn't want people to, say, to watch this and say, well, I just, I just have a, you know, a, a, a two bedroom house or something like that. I, I he, you know, he wouldn't be interested in that. Mm. Um, and mm. that's really not the point. I, I if you're interesting, mm. that's what I want. Mm. I, I want, I want people to have good stories for me. I want people to tell me why they got into home sharing. I want people to tell me what they're, why they live where they do. Um, that is fascinating. I mean, I mean, I, these, these people that, who built the tree house, they, they had a, they had their own house like right through the woods. And I, as somebody who's grown up in, you know, suburban America and then lived in the city of Chicago for five years, the idea of people living out in a place where you can't see anybody, you have no neighbors, uh, you, you, you pass no neighbors on the way to your place is, is really intriguing to me Mm. and how people live the way they do. And that's really what I'm, the kind of things I'm looking for. If 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 your house is, uh, uh, you know, I, I I stayed on somebody who lived on a uh, a, a canal vessel in London. I went to London and did one. It was this one of these little skinny places that are parked on canals where you just are constantly ducking your head uh, the whole time you're on the boat. Um, you, you're a great example too, Mark. You live you live on a boat. You live on a boat, and uh, I have never lived on a boat, but I I love talking to you. Because just the idea that you do that, that intrigues me. And I told my kids that too. You know, my kids, some of the places that I stay, my kids are like, ooh, dad, you know, and I, and I, I, I tell them, I go, you know, you, you, you better be careful because you, you might meet somebody who has never left New York City and has no plans to. Mm. You might meet somebody who has lived out in the middle of the, the, in the wild and that's where they think you should raise your children. Um, so why not try it? Why not get to know, why not embrace how other people live as opposed to you telling them how you think they should live? I love what you're doing with the show because it's bringing out alternative uh, lifestyles. And uh, what I love, you know, I, I get judgment all the time from people about living on a boat. I'm sure because you do. People I'm have, sure you do. People have no yeah. idea whatsoever, right? But... You know, and that's their fault. That's their problem. And, and that's OK. But at the same time, I think in terms of it, it gives us another lesson in life that until we put ourselves in the shoes of somebody else and it can be in comedy, it can be in, in living where we live, how we live, all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we shouldn't be too quick to judge. But I'll tell you what, you've heard of a wonderful place in the United States called Billy Bunkport. Is that it? Yeah, Billy Bunkport. Have I Ken, pronounced it right Ken, this time? Kenny Bunkport. Ken, Kenny Bunkport. Kenny, Kenny Bunkport. Bunkport. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, you, you, other than, <laughs> yeah, other other than the first letter, you got it. Yeah, Kenny Bunkport, Maine. I've died. It's where President Bush. That, it's where George Bush, the first one, used to vacation. I, I knew that part of it. Yeah, so I'm I'm just scrambling with my names in the U.S. today for some reason, but yeah, but there's a guy up there that lives on a mini submarine. Now you should go and stay no. with him. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I would love that. So now, see, uh, I absolutely love that. That would be way cool. That's the sort um, of thing you're after, right? Yeah, you know. And as I said, it, it's it's either got to be an interesting property or an interesting person. If you're both, all the better. Mm. You know, I I've stayed in a um, I stayed in a tiny house in Boise, Boise, Idaho, mm. 
And that was, you know, that's a that's a new thing too. People want to be people who are very uh, environmentally conscious, want to stay in those places, and that's what that's what these people were all about. They were all about, you know, just uh, being green and carbon footprint and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would I would stay in. Uh, plus, I've never been to Maine. I, that's one of three states I've never been to. Only three states I've never been to in the United States. So um, I want to go to all fifty of them. So if I could if I could hit Maine and you know cross that off the list and stay in a submarine, all the better. <laughs> Maine Maine's a beautiful part of the world, and I'll tell you what, there's some really good golf courses up there really good golf courses i bet the golf season is like about six weeks long yeah it is yeah yeah i was was gonna say don't go up there after don't go up there after september october yeah because it's uh equally as nasty as any place you've ever been i played golf in alaska and i was in alaska for the first time in like and i played in like mid-august and even that was was pushing it Mm, mm. (laughs) i was going to ask you about the boise idaho experience was that a house made of potatoes no, it was not. You know, it's weird. I've been to Boise because I've done several shows for the Boise Chamber of Commerce. They've had me back to host their annual event. And uh, I I don't know where the potatoes are, but I I ain't seen them when I've been out there. So I must be going down the wrong road. A lot of, it looks like a very metropolitan city. It's a lot of potatoes in Boise, Idaho, I can tell you. Yeah. I can tell you. Okay, well, listen, before I let you go today, I want you to share some positive, uplifting, and inspiring dialogue with my listeners and watchers around the world about, you know, where, where things are at, where can they get their comedy from, and what have you got coming up in the next few weeks that they can dial into? Yeah, well, uh, we talked a little bit about about how you really need to see the positive benefits of humor as opposed to constantly be on your guard all the time and saying, I can't laugh at that, or it's not politically correct to laugh at that type of thing. I think right now everybody needs to laugh. Um, I have, I'm still occasionally getting clients or potential clients that say, I, you know, because of the pandemic and because it's all doom and gloom and because we had to lay off 10% of our workforce and so forth, it's just not a good time for us to be laughing. You want to really, you want to really get my hackles up Tell me that. Tell me it's not a good time for us to be laughing. And I will immediately get in your face and say it is always a good time to be laughing because it is. And I always say, I said, I've been to some hilarious funerals. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's never not a good time to be laughing. So never think that for a minute. Uh, find something to laugh at. I don't think and, – and when I do this show, my – my virtual show is called You Can't Quarantine Laughter mm-hmm. for the reasons I just said. Mm-hmm. And I, I very I say to people on these virtual shows that I do, I say, if you're COVID-19 is not funny, I, I'm not going to make jokes about a disease that has claimed, you know, over 100,000 lives just in this country alone. And where it's more and more likely every show that somebody on that call, on that virtual call, either know somebody who's had it, has had it, know somebody who's passed away from it. It's not a funny subject. However, uh, a lot of the things that we're doing as a result of the quarantine are funny, uh, whether it's homeschooling your kids, whether it's learning how to cook again, whether it's having these Zoom calls all the time and having your dog bark and your baby cry and your and your wife walk into the room and say, what are you doing? I thought this was an hour later. Uh, you know. <laughs> That kind of thing. So those are the kind of things you have to laugh at. And that's that's what I try to convey to my audiences. As far as where you can see me, um, right now, again, most of my most of my uh, even my virtual shows are private. But if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, YouTube dot com forward slash Greg Schwem or, or on my website, you can see a lot of examples of a virtual and um, and what it's doing for people. And you can hear them laughing. Mm. You can see them, mm. and you can hear them laughing, mm. and and you can show that it can be successful. Mm. Well, listen, it's been always amazing having you on the show. I really appreciate always. having having a the chat time just chat with you. Flies. <laughs> it's amazing Mark, how, how fast we start. We start getting off on tangents, and uh, before you know it, we've been on the phone over an hour. And again, I say this: it is a credit to you. It's a credit to you that I never ever feel like this interview is dragging. I might uh, I might threaten everybody and tell them that I'll put all the stuff on there uh, that we talked about before the show started re- recording and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can wind you up that yeah, way as well. I, I'll PayPal you some money for, to not do that. You, you, you're almost <laughs> becoming our resident uh, in-house comedian, so we'll have to get you back again sometime in the future, Greg, and you can and give you us an know, update. And, and you know I would jump at that chance. Fantastic. Well, listen, have a brilliant evening. Look after the fish and um, be careful of playing golf in New Zealand. 
Okay. There you Just go. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> See you, Greg. Thank you. See you later.